Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the Application Security Podcast. This is Chris Romeo. I'm the CEO of Security Journey and co-host of podcast as well as application security lover. Robert Hurlbutt joins me today as well as my co-host. Hey, Robert. Hey, Chris. Yeah, it's Robert, uh, threat modeling architect and also a lover of application security. Another t-shirt we should have. We need a, we need a t-shirt archive. Like, Definitely. I don't know. There's so many... <laughs> Things we say on this podcast that feels like they belong on T-shirts. I fear that nobody would actually buy one, though. But maybe other than family members would Small buy one. Small market, but hey, great ideas. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're joined today by Jorn Freidunk. And Jorn is a person that I got connected to through OWASP's Global Conference and I was going through and looking at some of the different talks that were happening. And I read his title. I looked at the slides. And I said, this is somebody that the application security audience wants to hear from. But Jorn, before we get to our topic at hand, we have to always start with our guest's origin story. So how did you get into this crazy, wild world of application security? Yeah. Well, thank you, Chris and Robert, for having me on the podcast. So I started out end of the 90s as a software cracker. Of course, you can't really put that in the resume, but that's how it started out, by removing um, basic dongles from software and trained myself on the more most expensive software then. And <clears throat> one of the software um, programs, I showed this to my colleague or my, yeah, my college colleague, and he became a manager in a security project that developed this FIPS 140 certified hardware module that um, contained money for franking machines then, for stamps. So that was at that point they developed a mo uh, module that uh, contained up to a million dollars and that was US certified by the Postal Service. And that got me in the door of the, um, the security space because that was different than everybody was expecting at that point. I was like all open, not all secure, like no secret. And I got my head and my, my start in the security world. Based on that project. So you came to security from more of the breaking perspective. I did. I did. I did. Yep. Reversing assembly language, reversing code, looking at you know, what what is there, what you know, knopping out, go no go points, things like that. And then I shifted into now. Can you write assembly today? Still, I don't know that that. That ability depreciates over time, but I was able to read a lot in a very fast way. You know, that, that is more like that. Um, not sure if I can still do it. I didn't try. Yeah, I've, I've never been able to write assembly, so probably not even read it either. But so how'd you get to, how'd you go from hardware to AppSec then? How'd you get in, how'd you make the transition to software? This Well, this was a well, CC++ project. So it was software and hardware, both. And then it was early 2000s, I switched to the bank in Germany. That's where I'm originally from. Um, worked at a finance portal and then backend system for ATM manufacturers. And then actually moved to the States. Uh, and there was this, what I consider the silicon, so the death valley of security, nothing really going on until mid 2014. In between, there were little on and off projects. And then I got and I'm working for a company that data analytics and that morphed into a cybersecurity platform. And since I had security in my resume, a lot of companies and, and projects picked that up from, from there. So that's that's how I made the transition into that space. And with a developer background, that's, you know, was prone to do AppSec. So uh, one of our topics that we're going to be talking about today is anti-patterns mm -hmm. or security anti-patterns, <clears throat> design anti-patterns. Uh, could you help us understand, our listeners understand, uh, what is that? What is a security design anti-pattern? Yeah, so similar to when developers go out and fetch some code of um, Stack Overflow, for instance, with all the vulnerabilities in that, you know, like turn how to make some something run. There's another level to that, and that is that they also copy paste setups or patterns on higher level architectural patterns um, between teams or projects or somebody names something on the internet how certain things are done, and with that they also copy paste the potential flaws and the um, the things that need to be fixed in those um, in, in those projects. So that's a higher level pattern, but it's same thing, copy paste or copying how certain things are done. And then the the problem that we're facing is with the open source that 
they usually stop at very, you know, at, at, once they run, like on the very minimal level and uh, like authentication, for instance, and they don't go deeper because that's not what they're, they're intended to address. And, and, and that's usually the level of um, setup that you, that you, that you would typically see when developers use certain um, setups of, of um, components that they're hooking together. So when I think Stack Overflow, and, and because you mentioned it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use, mm -hmm. kind of draw out that example a little bit more. I think one of the big challenges with Stack Overflow is that the code that gets copied and dropped into production applications at the end of the day has been known to have various flaws and vulnerabilities in the code that's put on Stack Overflow. There's a few academic studies even that have gone out and looked at this and said, you know, just because something's the highest voted doesn't necessarily mean it's secure. Correct. And they've got lots of data to back that up. So, so you're, you're saying from a, a security design anti-pattern is the same thing. It is, it, it, so developers are going out and finding architectural blueprints, for example. But so what you're saying though, is that those are flawed blueprints that they're, that they're well, finding yeah. and then they're building on top of. Two, two areas. They, they might be flawed a little bit, but they're mostly lacking certain things, right? That is, they're not fully considering all the security variations that we would have to consider because the, when they look at the blueprints, the, the biggest, the biggest documented area is to, how to get this running. So the, the system that they're looking at in the blueprint, not how to get this running in a secure way with all the variations. So it's a missing, so it's missing pieces versus yeah. Yeah. bad architectural decisions that are being laid out on the page. It's just that the architects who are the source for these aren't even considering yeah. security. And then developers are grabbing those and running with them. And so they're ending up with something. It's the age old problem of like, you know, where do security requirements come from and how do they fit in? They don't get considered early in the process. Something gets built. It doesn't, it doesn't take into consideration the, the basic security functionality that we need. Yep. That's the missing part. And then it becomes painful later on, you know, when they have to fix it, right? That's, you know, the, the missing features basically in right? the, the application. Yeah. You know, when I think of that, um, one for one example I think of for a design pattern, a security pattern, and then anti-pattern. Pattern is you always authorize after you after you authenticate, uh, so you don't just assume that authentication is enough. And the anti-pattern is you do. That's enough. I've authenticated. That's basically the same as authorization. Let's go on, and uh, and so you can get yourself in trouble by by simply missing, as I understand what how you're defining, missing some key aspects. And so what you think may be enough for a secure design is not simply because it's not correctly implemented or, or thought through uh, and followed through on all the missing pieces uh, that need to be in there. Yep, exactly that. Yep, agree. So you, you also talk about security debt. And so this is one of those terms, it's one of those loaded terms right? Because oh, yeah. it's, it's technical debt, security debt, people throw it around all the time. And one of my concerns with these types of terms is I don't think people are always talking about the same thing. And so when you, when you think security debt, what's your definition of that? And then where does security mm -hmm. debt come from? What are the sources? Yeah. So I, when I talk about security debt, I am considering features, the security features for the system. So I'm looking at a system and I'm, my frame of reference that the business businesses implement or business systems implement business functions and the security then um, prevents threats to those business functions and the implementation of those controls, which as control is like a feature, right? The, 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 the mitigation of those threats is a, is a control implementation. Um, the, when, when you delay this implementation though, over time, you're owing a workload item to the system to to be implemented to make it function properly. Now, in the beginning, this might not um, make much of a difference, but then if the whole business unit grows or the system grows, that might have a big impact up to the point where you have to throw the whole thing away and redo design the, the whole system because you can't retrofit it anymore. So the retrofitting piece is is actually the key point that you know if you have debt, you may not, not be able to retrofit it. Or worst case, it's like the bankruptcy case or the equivalent is that management goes and asks how, how long does it take to 
fix something and developers say, well, it takes too long. Well, it takes long. And then they come up with their own conclusion and say, well, this tech stack is something we can't fix, maintain anymore. And they throw it out, spinning up uh, like a parallel project with the next promising tech stack and switching the whole team out. That's one of the things that, you know, I, I think about, and you just got me thinking about this in more depth. I'd never really thought about the fact that security debt is something or technical debt even is something that could eventually like die on the vine almost. I guess I'm an eternal optimist. And so I'm thinking like, if it's security debt now, we'll eventually, we'll eventually take care of it over a certain period of time. And maybe that's an infinite period of time. Maybe that's the problem with me as an eternal optimist. The, the, the line is infinite to when we actually can close all that debt. But you're making me think about this a little differently in that there could be a time where we just declare security debt bankruptcy or security bankruptcy and we throw everything out. But it's, it almost seems like, are we any better with the next tech stack though, in your mind? Sometimes, sometimes you are, because some of those um, issues can be addressed, but like as a blanket pattern in the newer tech stacks that, that like think, think cross set scripting, for instance, in Java or JSP is totally, is a custom implementation in other languages that's built in. So yeah, there, there are certain things, of course, that, you know, that, that can be used in, in, in a newer tech stack. But then there are other things like Go, for instance, that doesn't have a versioning system in terms of vulnerabilities. Well, they, now they do, but that that could also mean they're revisiting older, um, older issues that have been addressed in other languages or stack stack before. Yeah, so you almost end up with some trade-offs there between new tech stacks that are going to be able to eliminate some of your old tech debt but you also have a scalability problem because if we're talking a team, you know, engineering team size of 10, we can do anything. We can throw the tech stack out and we can rewrite this whole thing and go by the end of the week. If you're talking about a 25,000 person engineering team, it's going to take us 10 years to migrate <laughs> to some other new upstanding language that has better solutions and things. So there's definitely trade off there between scalability and being able to just declare security debt bankruptcy. Correct, yeah. And that has to be baked in up front, right? That's why this whole threat modeling thing, things through it at the beginning is so important. Yeah. And I, and I was thinking a, a similar, uh, the trade-off with also risk. <clears throat> What's your acceptance of risk? As you go along and you know that you can't fix that security debt or you're not fixing it, then you are potentially increasing your risk. Uh, as you go along or accepting risk as you go along, uh, more risk as you go along. Yep. Uh, a recent talk that you did, uh, you listed uh, some uh, categories for these anti-patterns. Could you help us uh, understand some of the ones that you've identified? So in that, in that OR speech, I was talking about, um, I grouped the patterns and going to certain themes. And one is the common role misconception is one they started out with because it covers a lot of other patterns. Um, technical patterns, then authorization anti patterns, then something that has to do with time, timing, or time related anti patterns, and then systems that don't mix well and um, scalability anti patterns. So that's um, that, those are the areas that I'm sure there are more, and I, I know of some more, I would, but that was kind of the scope of what I was talking about. So, sh to ensure our audience has a perspective mm -hmm. on kind of what these <clears throat> things are. Give, give us like a one or two sentence definition of each one of these, okay. starting with common role misconception. Yep. And then just, just to kind of lay this set, set the stage so that people may be able to connect it with other things they're, okay. they're already, they've sure. already heard of. So the role misconception is I started out with that. Um, I didn't know if it was actually an anti-pattern until I start describing that more. It's a conceptual anti-pattern of how the roles in the, in the business are laid out. That has to do with the super user role and, and, and the business role. The authorization anti-patterns um, is is um, as it comes from the uh, shift in the design from monolithic systems to to um, web app web service deployed on multiple cluster kind of systems. So there are a lot of opportunities to to drop authorization in in, in different stages in in that in that pattern switch. That's what I addressed in in that. Um, time or timing-based anti-patterns. Now this, I thought it was time, and I used that term as a red flag term for um, for communication. 
and it has to do with time and execution, deferred execution. So and, and that's actually one pattern that, that covers a whole group of patterns. While I was describing that, I discovered that it's actually the same pattern in, a, in different variations that, that surfaces um, in, in different areas. It has to do with somebody puts instruction into into some form of code somewhere and then another system picks it up and there's a there's a switch okay that's that's what i call this time or execution based anti-pattern systems that don't mix well that's something that in the design phase we talk to teams about that and uh, there are certain systems that are hard to to mix like that's just from from features perspective um and then of course there's the scalability anti-pattern those are systems that work currently but then once you scale up and like do a lot more of it, it becomes it becomes an issue. And that's that's why I put on under that. I'm sure there are more categories, uh, but that's kind of like the natural flow of, of how I um, group them together. So how did you derive this list then? You know, I'm envisioning like, did you have a dream one night? You just woke up, you're like, give me a pen and paper, got to write yeah. these things down. like. This is the anti-pattern dream, or like, how'd you how'd you get to this list? Good question. So I, it wasn't a pattern on paper. So I, um, I was asked the question, why do you want to do threat modeling? And I, and and when why don't we just do an assessment later on? I was like, well, if you do A B C D, or if you miss A B C D, you'll, um, you experience sort of pain later on. So I, I started making a list in my phone, actually not on paper, I had my phone saying, okay, well, when next time somebody asks me, I'm going to bring up one of those things to just ask them if they're using that tech stack or that, that pattern. And it was not until I wrote up the proposal for the speech until I grouped them together um, and say, oh, wait a minute, there's, there's grouping here. I can actually group that and look. Um, so that came out of from a practical sense, just collecting them and, and put them into that scale and the scale or the, the, the groupings they according to the pain points, what the developers would experience, you know, grouping kind of like missing authentication is not really direct pain, but you know, feature pain, I guess. And, and the, the other ones, the systems that don't mix well and scalability, that's like current pain, can't do it, right? And deferred pain later in the future. So that's how I grouped them together. So talking about roles, we mentioned you know, roles. Uh, there's a, um, a malicious insider admin role yeah. uh, that I think sometimes can be overlooked. Uh, how how does that play into some of these, and in, in, what are your thoughts on on that in terms of the different use cases and anti patterns? Yeah, so this is when when you do a threat model, then usually it's there yeah, that the threat model goes through different stages, and at some point you end up with I would call it like a eighty percent inventory threat model of everything that's there. Then you at the stage where it's like an eighty twenty rule where you would add um, the threats to the system as in threat use cases. And usually that's starting with external malicious actor. And then there are also the um, internal malicious actors. And that that is became more and more significant over the last years now for there are two trends that contributed to that being very um, relevant. One is the offshoring threat, right? So you have um, the classic offshore that started like in mid 2000, where they put the development teams in other countries and the value of data versus the salary is, is pretty high. So and uh, that's one trend. So you have a lot of people that potentially have access to data where that salary is high. Now in the Western world, where the salary, where the salary is high and the data value is low, that that trade-off is not that relevant. And then, and then together with the second trend is this um, the CICD automation and the, um, the DevOps trend, where you have a lot more people on top of developers that have those internal roles, those internal admin roles, for instance, that have access to the system indirectly through automation scripts or some other, um, so, so yeah, some other systems. And then with that, it's not we're saying that the user per se is, is a bad person. We don't assume that, but statistically, you have to assume that one of their roles flips over, or the system gets ca captured. Like think a lot for J tunnel, right? Like going into the first hop, and then what is actually the the blast radius or the access at that point. So that's why that, that uh, malicious insider is, it becomes more and more relevant. Yeah, and you think about, you know, to the couple of examples you shared, like the, you know, site reliability engineers that are responsible for the DevOps build pipeline, <clears throat> for example. Mm -hmm. yep. Like, 
a lot of like we still don't focus enough on the trusted insider role in this case the malicious insider role you know i know that i when i'm thinking threat modeling i'm often thinking outside in is my primary uh, motivation and i think that's a good reminder here yorn that you're sharing about you know we have to consider the inside out as well and start looking at you know what type of controls do we have between the different functional people who are supporting a DevOps pipeline, for example, you know, cause there, there's a lot of organizations and I'll, I'll dare say most organizations where a malicious admin insider could do almost whatever they want at this stage without anybody really detecting it. You know, it's not like they're doing code reviews of configuration changes and maybe somebody's doing that out there and get, listen, if you're out there and you're like, no, wait, my organization, we do code reviews of every configuration change that has anything to do with our DevOps pipeline send us a message. I'd love to interview you and understand how that works because it seems like that would be very slow going in a DevOps world. So um, I think that's that, that the malicious insiders is something that's that we need to, we need to pay more attention to from a threat modeling perspective. I mean, Robert, from your threat modeling experience, is that, is that a, a is that somebody that you're looking at the malicious insider often, or how does that fit into your world? Yeah, occasionally. Uh, certainly, I mean, like you said, uh, mostly from the outside in, but but certainly in terms of processes, in terms of uh, business processes that are really critical, absolutely. You're looking at inside because the thing it's uh, sometimes we forget is that typically the outsider is one of their tasks or one of their objectives is to try to look like an insider that you will completely ignore. And so if you look at the insider, you, you may think, well, we trust everybody here, but how do you know it's not an outsider that it's now posing as an insider? And so you do need to look at it. And uh, certainly critical operations uh, are important uh, in, in terms of those insider access and so forth. Okay, so let's, Jorn, dive into the common role misconception mm -hmm. as an example here. And so I want you to run through this one in a lot more depth and explain it to us closely. <clears throat> We're not going to do this for all of them. We are going to provide a yeah. link to Jorn's global OWASP talk. So you can go listen to the full entire talk and hear the deeper explanation about each of these. But I did want to explore one of them just so folks have an idea. What are they going to get when they go listen to the full talk? Yeah, thank you. So this, this common role misconception, as I mentioned before, is like a conceptual leads to the conceptual anti-pattern. And that comes from the question um, of an attacker's point of view, which role is the most valuable from the attacker point of view? And if you ask that question to the developer, they usually say, well, yeah, the name of the game is become root. You know, every capture the flag event is aimed at that. Now, if you think about value, though, well, is the, the sysadmin root certainly has, um, has ability to access computing power that leads to value like for um, hijacking or you know, crypto mining or something like that, and also some data. But then, um, if you if you um, since we are securing a business function, there's usually a business function that's higher, and that in in, in, in real world terms, that would be if you go and call in uh, into a company and want a refund for a credit card transaction, there's this power user you talk to the customer service representative, and I call it the power user or business ferry. The person that can make it rain right? that has direct access to money and also direct access to a lot of data because they can, for instance, rename you in the system if you get married or something. They can they have access to a lot of broad data and direct potentially kick off direct transactions. And in, in that sense, that role to capture that role is actually the more realistic role where an attacker would go and try to get access to one of those roles either by social engineering or by flipping a system that runs that role. So that the failure then to plan for this higher level role, that's that's an anti-pattern that I um, identified, um, which has an impact then on, on certain other areas for implementation, for instance, when you have to consider this. So you have to plan for a role that's higher than a sysadmin and consider the sysadmin role as a, as a helper role in the middle, not the highest top level business function role. What's the... Um corresponding uh, pattern, yeah. essentially. So there's an anti-pattern, so yeah. what's the corresponding pattern? So the, the pattern where this surfaces is this, first off, the zero trust architecture pattern, right? To double check and double check that somebody is, is running in a certain role. Then this whole anti-pattern deals with scoping or the wrong 
well, not the blast radios, if somebody gets access to a system, can they actually run in the, in the highest level role? So, for instance, think about refund system. Then you would, if you consider the, the root, the highest level, the, um, the root role would have access to keys of the mounted systems, but they don't have to have that access to those keys, to all of them. For instance, you would definitely separate signing keys for transactions from um, the key storage that deals with in, in their systems that interact with each other internally. And so that, and then you would, and the outcome of that would be that you have maybe a dual responsibility for that vault that holds the signing transaction signing key um, and, and, and require like a business user or business manager together with the admin to go in and, um, and, and change something around so that not a single person can do that by themselves. So you have to think about that, um, where, what that means if you give an admin then access to those systems that run those business functions. In the idle case, the, the business systems, they don't, they, they just run and don't have visibility in, in anything that, you know, that's, that's critical. But of course, it's not the case because secrets are mounted to systems, but then not all secrets should be mounted equally across the whole backplane. Then, right? You have to separate that out. So in the, the, the key space, for instance, um, Separating the key spaces out, that's one of those patterns you, you would have to think about by the business units or by those critical business roles. The other thing is that breaking glass, whenever somebody logs into those applications that deals with production data or transactions, that somebody gets notified that it's, it's relevant from the business unit. That's another pattern that you can use for this. So as we start to kind of bring this conversation towards a, a closing part, I wanted to explore a little bit about what can we do to limit security debt? So you've talked about this catalog of anti-patterns. How do we put this into action now for somebody who's listening to this saying, hey, I've got you know 250 developers in my organization. I've got 10 architects that drive this. I'm trying to, to get us to a better security posture. What do they do with these things that you've built here to help limit security debt? Yeah. So the first big, the biggest action is, is awareness, right? You have to know about it, that, that those things exist. And that means that you create a place for it where that is documented in confluence. Um, the, 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 there's patterns, a single, like patterns that deal with smaller scoped systems, like a queue, for instance, those things, uh, those patterns, those descriptions can go into the threat library if you do threat monitoring, for instance. The rest can go into like a wiki or conference page, um, or you can create some starter thread models that um, that have those patterns in them. Now, the one thing though that's relatively important is that uh, when when those things are documented, those patterns that is that um, you have to create like an easy entry for the developers that don't have that abstract abstraction level knowledge. So they like a jump page with red flag terms like Q timing, something that they get reminded of to look at and, and read and see and check out the pattern if it's actually relevant to them. The, so that, that, that helps um, create, um, yeah, that they can actually identify it. Then the next thing is that's on us um, as a security um, personnel, we need to get feedback from the developers of what is hard to implement. So the, I would say the complexity is not the same. So we have to track it. And, and someone asked them, hey, do your libraries now support ABCD? For instance, end-to-end -end, um, payload encryption. It's definitely harder because it involves two parts with mounted keys and all kind of things in the middle that you don't losing visibility then. And if that for whatever reason would come up early on, we have to ask that, do you ever, ever would require endpoint and encryption, then please put that in right away. That's one of those things just knowing from the complexity that they have to do that early on, just put a placeholder in their code or something like this, that, that that's already there. Um, on the operational side though, they, um, we have a trend to doing infrastructure service with modules, for instance, you can, uh, we can have um, services that are fully configured. You know, think about the, the if, you, if you download like a SQL database appliance, they usually have already scripts in there that, that separate the regular user from the power user, uh, sorry, for the admin. And, and you can build your own platform services 
accordingly now too with fully require fully configured services that's one of those more practical things you can do um or use like pre-configured um infrastructure service modules that that work across multiple different modules when they work together that's another more practical approach like have a pre-configured queue for instance that turns certain things off or um when you're dealing with um interaction with other systems that they once they include other modules, then um, you already have a set of pre-configured variables that have to be filled in order to function properly. So that's um, that's what so it's an, so there's an awareness. I mean, there's an awareness play in that we need developers and architects to understand. You know, what are all these different categories of of things to consider. I heard about, I heard you talk about there's, there's inputs to other processes like threat modeling, having these be things that people can use, whether that's with template threat models. And then there's also just reference kind of service approaches where, you know, you, you've got a, a series of best practices that are being applied, maybe in a standard way with a template or something so that, you know, you're, you're providing a pattern you know, countering an anti-pattern with a pattern that provides me with all the things I need to be successful. Um, you know, it's that that default security approach, which, you know, throughout my career, I've watched as we get closer and closer to that, you know, taking away the options for people to make insecure choices, for example, when rolling out a new service. Um, I, I've seen a lot of progress in 25 years, but the funny thing is we're still not there. And I don't know that we'll ever get to the point where it's like, there is no insecure option, but we can certainly dream. So what, uh, Jorn, do you see as a call to action or a key takeaway for our audience here? Like, what do you want them to do as a result of learning about security design anti-patterns and security debt? I'm hoping it's not declare security debt bankruptcy. I'm hoping that is not your key takeaway. Well, not, well that we, because we already talked about it, so that's a good start, right? We need to spread the message. That's the key, the key takeaway. It's, hey, there's a different level, right, that, uh, that we need to address. It's not the little bitty threats that everybody is kind of throwing around already. There's a bigger scope, and we need to address it in a more um, in, in a more organized fashion. For instance, you know, they, but we need the feedback from the developers for this. We can't do that as security developers, security personnel, um, because we don't know what's all out there. Right? So we need that feedback loop for them to, to point and say, "Hey, what about this? Where does this fall into play? You know, where, is, is this a pattern?" So we. We need to raise that awareness and probably document it somewhere, maybe OWASP project, I don't know. Think about that. Um, the categorization is, is a bigger challenge because that that is at, at this you need to have the data like the, in multiple variations first before you can categorize it. And my scope is also limited to you know my, my career. So that we need um the the community to, to feed into that too. Hey, what what could be a good categorization? And and for Paul uh, you know, topology for, for this in order to address, then then point to the right correct patterns, right? That's kind of the, the goal there. You you name the inner patterns and then you point to the ones that um that would fix certain things. That so that um I would say documentation and, and awareness uh is, is a good start and, 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 and asking for that, asking for feedback. And right? we need that feedback um from the community for this. Well, very good. Jorn, thank you for taking the time to share the security design anti-patterns approach and security debt and, you know, all the experiences and things that you've shared with us here. Thank you for providing that for our audience. And, um, you know, their call to action is to go dive deeper into this topic. And so once again, thank you for the time today. Thank you for the education and uh, keep keep chasing down these security design anti-patterns. I will do. Thank you. And thank you for having me on the show. Thank you.